Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Otero County in New Mexico, two sisters were on their way to their mother's place to pick up children for a birthday party. As they turned onto the dirt gravel road to the house, they saw something sitting by the left side of the road. When the car's lights illuminated it, it stood up to a height estimated to be seven feet or more. One of the sisters refused to look at it after one glance. It was reported to me that the eyes seemed red in the headlights. It was hairy all over with a kind of pointed head, long arms, and no neck. It moved off towards the river. The sisters turned into their mother's driveway and did not see it again. They were very frightened and were sure it was not a bear or a human. My husband and I were visiting our adopted family in August. We were in our pop-up camper, parked by the river and behind the brush arbor across the driveway from Grandma's house. Next door to her house lived her son and his family. Her son was away on a fire along with his son, but his wife and daughter were at home. We had set up our camp, ate, visited, and went to bed early at around 11 p.m. Everyone was asleep except me and I was drifting into sleep when I felt a very strong jolt to our camper, which made everything rattle. I thought it might be a horse or a cow, but the impact was higher than a horse or a cow, like at the roof line. I was too scared to move, but didn't know why. Nothing more happened. So I went to sleep and told my husband about it the next morning. He sleeps like a log. Two days later, the whole group of us, maybe 20 people, had cooked and eaten outside, and after cleanup, we all sat around the fire in the brush arbor, enjoying the cool evening and visiting with old friends. I was talking and way off somewhere, kind of remembered hearing a sound like a baby crying. The little girl sitting next to me said, Did you hear that? I responded that I didn't hear anything, and she said, that weird howl. Immediately, the adult stood up and told the children to go to the house, that it was time for bed. They all heard it, whatever it was. My husband and I got our two little granddaughters and sat there for a short while, wondering what was going on, and then went into our trailer and went to sleep. The dogs barked and howled almost all night. The next morning, I woke up and went to the house for coffee. All of the family members were already there, talking. I listened for a while, and the topic of conversation intrigued me, so I asked what everyone is talking about. Dead silence. I jokingly said it sounded to me like they were talking about Bigfoot. One and then another of them began talking about it, and I said, why didn't you tell me? Their response was that they didn't want to scare us off. I told them I'd been interested in this for years. Then the stories came out. Two of the grandchildren the previous night had been on their way to their grandmother's house. As they turned off from the main highway to the old highway, there is a sharp left-handed curve in the road, about 50 yards in and where the remains of the old highway continues to a dead end to the right, they saw the being. It was right at the curve where they saw, crossing in front of their vehicle, a very large, hairy, long-armed figure, which they observed to them cross the dead end portion of the road and crash up the hill through the brush. They continued on to Grandma's house. As we all sat and listened to this, and every one of us believed them, L.S., a son-in-law, suggested that we all go look for sign at the site where this occurred. L.S. is an Eskimo from Siloic, Alaska, and he is a hunter. 
I wanted to go, but was still in my pajamas and robe, so I told them to go without me. When I got there, they were gone, so I returned back to the house. When they returned, Lewis said there were droppings, tracks, and matted down grasses and chicken feathers, but no signs of bones or other scraps. His view of the droppings, as related to me then, is that they don't belong to a bear or any other animal he knows of. They contained seeds and plant material and bore a resemblance to human feces, except for size and quantity. Before we got to Melascaro, Grandma said she woke up early one morning and noticed a huge handprint on her dining room window, which is a large window beneath which the table sits. She went outside to clean it off so the grandkids and others wouldn't see it and be scared. Grandma is proud of her flower garden of lilies, and she said the flowers were trampled down by something heavy. Again, there were no horses around. Later, I was told that howls and screams occur frequently at night, and they have all heard them and cannot identify them. They all remarked about the bad odors they have smelled on night when the dogs, which are tied up, have barked and barked. One of the granddaughters was sitting in the living room one night watching TV when she happened to look out the window and see something looking in at her. All she could say was that it was big and hairy. The family advises that these strange sounds and occurrences began in their area about November years ago. There is plenty of cover in this area, including a wash or arroyo in which Grandma and her daughters go to gather tea, which activity they told me they were now afraid to do. They told me that easy access to the river is why there are sightings. They do not believe there is anything they have done in the Indian way to have caused this. I was told that a mountain lion made his or her home on the ridge across from the house, but since these noises and sightings have happened, there is no sign of the mountain lion anymore. I spoke with Grandma a week or so ago, and she told me that the sounds are heard almost every night at about 2 or 3 a.m. Her daughter works with a man who is tracking owls at night for the EPA while doing an owl study. Evidently, he has seen and heard things on the ridge near their home. There have also been reports of trash cans and dumpsters being rummaged through and people emptying their trash, catching something in their headlight at these locations. Witnesses were all family members. There were at least two witnesses to the sighting by the vehicle. Only Grandma saw the handprints on the window and everyone heard the howl or what I thought was a baby crying. Probably 20 or so people. There are lots of local stories here. One which is sort of a legend involves a Hispanic woman who lived near Captain, was supposedly kidnapped by a Bigfoot some years ago, and finally came home with lots of broken bones and pregnant. The child grew up looking funny, so I was told, and always looking for a fight. During my visit, the family told me about an Apache man who was at a feast somewhere out on the reservation. He left the clearing where the ceremony was taking place and went into the woods to urinate. As he did so, something allegedly picked him up and flung him about. I am told that this man is big, about six foot two, but he was tossed around easily and scared to death. On the next morning, one of the daughters said she had just read an article about some very large tracks being found around the Alaki Lakes between the towns of Alamo Gordo and Las Cruces, New Mexico, on Highway 70. This area is not part of the Apache Reservation. For some years, I've gone with some family to Mesa Calero to help cook for the 4th of July feast, which involved the coming out of the young girls of this family. We have always camped at the family's place. However, I have been told that the sounds kept people who were camped out at the feast grounds up almost all night. The sound came from the little canyon between the feast grounds and the rodeo grounds on the hill almost right in Mesa Calero. The family has also told me of other incidents 
way back when grandma was young. All of these incidents occurred at dark and late at night. The weather was typically late summer, hot in the day, cool and clear at night. Lighting in all cases was by vehicle headlights. This is a rural area, so night lighting is usually from a yard light. These incidents occurred within the boundaries of the homelands of the Mescalero Apaches in New Mexico. Mescalero is a small community located in south central New Mexico on Highway 70, about equidistant from Roduso to the east and Tula Rosa to the west. The nearest big cities are El Paso, Texas and Albuquerque, New Mexico. Mescalero community sits in a valley surrounded by mountainous terrains, heavily wooded with oak, walnut, and various conifers. A stream runs through Mescalero Cross under the highway and runs along what is called the Old Highway. It is at two sites along the Old Highway that two sightings have occurred. Homes are located along this road, with some just back from the highway. On to the next one. In California, a female prospector saw an adult male Bigfoot and an adult female Bigfoot on several occasions. The creatures took apples and grapes that the witness left out for them. On to the next one. In Humboldt County in California, I grew up in the woods of the Pacific Northwest. My father also grew up there. He was born in Klamath Falls, Oregon, but grew up in eastern San Francisco Bay Area. He has a bachelor's in forestry, a master's in zoology, and a PhD in entomology, and worked as a research scientist with the U.S. Forest Service for most of his 20 to 30 years of service. My father did research on insects that predate timber harvest species in California and Oregon. When he did his research, usually in the summer and fall, my younger brother and I would accompany him into the woods. My father was and is a great woodsman, a hunter and fisherman who taught my brother and myself all about the forest and what types of plants and animals live there. My father was also a man of science, and this is important to note as it will become evident later. At the end of each summer season, my family and some other forestry families would get together and take several weeks of vacation. Most often, we would load canoes and float down to the lower 15 to 30 miles of the Klamath River to its mouth. My father and I would fly fish for steelhead in the riffles during the mornings and evenings, and we would spend the hot hours of the day canoeing, exploring, resting. These trips would often take one to two weeks to complete. During one of these trips, we made camp on the river bar at the mouth of Tech Tuck Creek. There was a good flat bar there. And at that time of year, the creek was flowing under the sand and appeared dry. One afternoon, while everyone else was napping, my father and I took a walk up the creek bed to see if the creek was flowing on the surface somewhere inland. About 200 yards upstream, the creek did come to the surface and flowed sluggishly through a series of large pools. I remember my dad telling me that these pools were probably full of baby salmon and steelhead waiting for fall rain to allow them to swim down to the main river and out to sea. My dad had a very scientific mind, and he would describe natural processes in great detail when we had the patience to listen. As we proceeded inland up the creek, we rounded a bend and entered a long sandy bar on the east side of a long arching pool in the creek. As I looked across the surface of the bar, I saw a set of tracks in the soft sand. These tracks caught my attention because they were very large and the space between them seemed very long, as if, like if I laid down next to them, they would almost be further apart than the length of my body. The tracks also seemed to sink a lot deeper into the sand than the footprints of my dad, who is pretty big at six foot two. 
the track began at the water's edge at the lower end of the bar and proceeded diagonally across the bar in a straight line to the far end of the bar. My father had never told me any stories about Bigfoot. He would deny the existence of any animal that was unknown until science recognized it anyhow. And to my knowledge, I had not heard of any such animal at the time, nor had I anything more than passing interest in these types of things then. But these tracks, their size, gait, and the way they led across the bar in a straight line, they made a funny impression on me. My father was also very interested in the tracks. He asked me, please, not to walk near or in them, then asked me to sit down while he spent several minutes comparing his foot size to them and trying to match their spacing by walking next to them. He seemed very tense, as if he sensed something or was trying to figure something out. Eventually, I got bored of sitting and got up and followed him. When I finally caught up with him, we were halfway up the bar. He had stopped looking at the tracks and was instead looking intently at the timber ahead and at the southern edge of the bar. He was very quiet and tense. I've never seen my father frightened or worried about anything before or since, for that matter, but watching him the way he scanned the surrounding forest so intently made me very nervous and excited. I broke the silence and began to ask him what he thought made the tracks and what he was trying to see in the trees. He turned around, almost jumped a little in surprise, and told me to be quiet. Then he looked around some more and started back toward the camp with a quick pace, grabbing me by the hand and saying these are the tracks of a big bear son and we should leave the area from now on. Then he told me not to come up the creek alone and not to tell Mama or my brother or any of the others anything about what we saw, that it might worry them or something, and that he would speak no more of this matter, just like that. Well, the older I get, the funnier the incident and those tracks seem to me. I have hunted for many years and have seen and tracked many animals in the woods since that time and have never seen anything like that since. I'm 38 now and my father has retired. I asked my father about this incident last year and he was silent and pensive for a long time. Then, he told me that he doesn't remember this time or seeing anything other than bear track. I don't know what we really saw that day, but I do know that it scared my dad, and he has never ever spoken to me the way he did on that day, or behaved that way since. It was very quiet, and as a small boy in the country, I have many times felt uneasy about the woods around me like I was being watched. Sometimes I would sit and look and listen for long periods but never saw or heard anything. After doing lots of research in later life, I learned there are many stories about this area throughout history. I was a wildlife management student at Humboldt State University and spent many an hour pouring through the McLaren collection at the library there. At the time I saw these tracks, though, I knew little or nothing about Bigfoot. It was a sand and gravel creek bar flanked on both sides by Douglas fir pine, cedar, maple, and madrone trees on steep hills. There was a dense understory. On to the next one. Mr. West Strang, who lived near Oroville in Butte County in California, saw a squatting Bigfoot outside his house. West and the creature looked at each other, and after a while, West went inside to watch TV. On to the next one. Mr. Charles Maudlin was in a boat when he saw Bigfoot running on an abandoned road near Feather River near Oroville in Butte County in California. On to the next one. In Calveras County in California, in November, Mike Scott, 26, a logger, and another man shot three rounds into a hairy humanoid at 30 yards. It fled uphill on two legs, leaving a trail of blood. Scott fled too. 
On to the next one. Buzz McLaughlin and several others saw a bad-smelling nine-foot-tall Bigfoot from a ranch school window in Ham Palm in Trinity County in California. It was described as like a giant gorilla. Previously around here, a Bigfoot had shaken the car of a witness near Blue Lake and a family saw a Bigfoot at Trinity River. On to the next one. Mr. Clifford Brush shot a Bigfoot four times with a twenty two caliber rifle in Butte Creek Canyon near Chico in Butte County in California. The creature had been waving its arms after growling at him as he went to get water at his well. After shooting it, it went away, making cries of pain. On to the next one. In Alameda County in California, in May, Archie Buckley enticed a tall, hairy humanoid into his camp three times using a salmon lure to attract it. The man-beast was seven and a half feet tall and weighing at least 800 pounds. Footprints were found that were 15 inches long. On to the next one. In Trinity County in California, in June, a seven and a half foot tall hairy humanoid was seen by Archie Buckley. Archie had hung a fish in a tree as bait and waited in his Volkswagen. After 3 a.m., the moon went down, and then Archie spotted something at the campsite. He swung a light onto the fish, which was untouched, and still swinging the light around, saw two glowing eyes 100 feet away. They belonged to a seven and a half foot tall, dark, hairy Bigfoot that weighed approximately 450 pounds. The next morning, Footprints 15 and a half inches long and six and a half inches wide were found coming close to where the Volkswagen had been parked. On to the next one. In Trinity National Forest in California in August, Ben E. Foster Jr., Sharon Gordon, and Richard Foster were camping on a fishing trip and had left out a bait of food items for a Bigfoot. Just after 8 p.m., Sharon saw a Bigfoot watching them from a hilltop, 150 feet away. Ben approached it to within 75 feet, and the boy and the Bigfoot watched each other for a few moments. And when Ben approached closer, the Bigfoot tossed a rock at him. The rock landed seven feet to his left while the creature retreated up the ravine. Half an hour later, Ben and Richard walked up the track looking for the Bigfoot, and Sharon saw another Bigfoot about 30 feet away. Sharon tried to start the car motor and the creature took off. During the night, the group saw forms of creatures and at least four pairs of bright glowing eyes in the darkness. Sharon stayed in the car. There were several other sightings that night and huge footprints were found as well. The Bigfoot were described as eight to 10 feet tall, weighing 500 to 800 pounds, built with egg-shaped heads, no hair on the face, and small eyes beneath the heavy brow ridge. The boy saw dark colored creatures while Sharon's was light. Up until then, tracks, a dead fawn, and feces were found in the area. On to the next one. This was in Puyallup in Pierce County in Washington. A friend and I were walking home from Sunrise Elementary School in the spring. This is on South Hill in Puyallup. There is an area of woods we had to go through between gravel pits to get home. We were on an overgrown logging road that had a ditch on one side. It was on our left as we walked. We were also not too far from some power lines. Both of us had sticks, and we were chopping down dandelions along the trail as we walked. My friend was in front, and I was about 20 feet behind him, chopping what he had missed. As I got to a big patch he missed, I stopped and started chopping away as my friend kept walking. The ditch was to my back now. Suddenly, I felt like someone was behind me. I turned around and was pretty much face to face with a Bigfoot. It was about eight feet away from me. 
My guess is it was sleeping or hiding in the ditch and just stood up to see what was going on. It could have reached out and grabbed me with no trouble. I think it was just as surprised to see me as I was to see it. It was standing in a ditch, so it wasn't towering over me, but it was still taller than me. It had red hair like an Irish setter dog and a little bit matted. It had wide shoulders and eyes that looked black, but to be honest, I didn't look for very long. It took me about two seconds. Then I ran and ran past my friend. He started running in right behind me, asking what was wrong. I just kept yelling to keep running. We ran all the way home. It didn't chase us. We lived on 123rd Street. Now I read and watch all I can on this matter. They are out there. I'm lucky enough to say I know this for sure. It scared the heck out of me. My best guess is my friend woke it up when he passed it, and then I was standing right there when it finally got up. It was right after school, about 3.45 p.m. Lighting was bright, and it was a clear day. The area was a small fir tree forest. This is in between power lines and a gravel pit. It was a small, overgrown logging road with a ditch on one side. On to the next one. This was in King County in Washington. One day, during a hike through the woods, my father and I heard large, heavy footsteps on the opposite side of a dirt mound we were standing near. We are both experienced hunters, and this sound was unmistakably made by an animal on two legs. We both stood still and listened to the footsteps walk by us. As the sound drew nearer, we became a little nervous. It was almost as though whatever was walking was going to walk right over the dirt mound that separated it from us. Suddenly, the footsteps stopped only a few feet from us. There was an incredible vibration in the air, as though it sensed us, and it knew that we knew it was there. After what seemed like eight to ten minutes, it resumed walking away. I think I must have broken the world record for the longest held breath. I know we should have inspected the other side of the dirt mound for tracks or something, but the impression of fear was so overwhelming that we did not have any desire to see what it was. We only knew we wanted to get away from there quickly. Soon after, we realized we relaxed a little and decided to start heading home. While walking to the car, we never talked at all until we were safely in our truck. People often talk about an odor of urine while encountering these creatures, but my recollection was a strong, pungent smell of ammonia. My dad and I were walking and talking, looking for grouse to shoot and take home. The environment was dense pine wood with hiking trails. The landscape was on a downhill slope. I remember there was a dirt mound that was about eight feet high and seemed to stretch for about 60 yards or so. The elevation and longitude and attitude are wherever Squawk Mountain is. On to the next one. This was on Shaw Road in Puyallup in Pierce County in Washington. I was camping in the woods near what is now called Crystal Ridge Housing Development off of Shaw Road. Around 11 p.m., I was awakened by a screaming sound in the distance. It sounded kind of like a woman, hard to describe really, but it absolutely got my attention. Every 15 or 20 seconds it would scream, and I could tell it was getting closer and closer. After a while, I could hear crashing in the brush. Whatever it was, it was moving fast. I rationalized it in my mind as a deer jumping through the woods quickly, but when I saw the outline of the deer, I knew immediately what it was. Granted, it was dark, but with the moon out and lack of cloud cover, I could make out a black shape, seven or eight feet tall, striding through the underbrush. I panicked and yelled as loud as I could, and the creature slightly changed course to go around me and keep on going, still with the occasional scream. In the morning, 
I looked for footprints and hair, but all I found was broken branches, too high to be broken by a man. There was a foul odor as the creature passed. My girlfriend was with me, sleeping, but did not wake until I yelled and woke her up. There were clear skies and a nearly full moon. Tree cover obscured some of the light. Years later, I was reading a Bigfoot book at the library that said there were at least three Bigfoot sightings near Shaw Road. On to the next one. We were in a driveway of a house north of mine in Port Angeles in Clallam County in Washington. My four friends and I were playing Chinese jump rope in their yard late one afternoon, just before evening. My neighbor owned somewhere around 100 acres across the street and the five-acre parcel we were playing on. He owned a herd of buffalo and, for some reason, had one young buffalo alone on this parcel. As my friends and I were playing, the buffalo caught our attention as it came running across the property. I remember we all looked up at it and wondered why it could have acted so spooked. We went back to playing, and a little bit later, one of my friends, the only boy, exclaimed, Did you guys see that? There was a tall black thing on two legs that just jumped across the creek. We all looked out into the field, but did not see anything. The rest of us told him to quit messing around, but he insisted he was serious. We dismissed his claims and continued our game. Since it wasn't my turn, I kept scanning the field, wondering what the boy may have seen. I noticed a black stump under a tree, which I could not recall being there before. I kept looking at it, thinking, is that a stump or something else? The shape looked like a tall black figure standing upright and leaning forward with very long arms down to its knees. The head was turned, looking directly at us. However, it was so still, I thought it had to be a stump. I felt it was looking directly at me, but it did not move at all. I kept my eyes fixed on it, but turned my head to make it look like I wasn't watching it. Immediately, it began to run across the field. It ran on two legs, had very long swinging arms and a flat face. It was very tall and covered in black hair. I yelled and everyone turned and started screaming. Upon hearing our screams, it turned to look at us and immediately turned its direction and ran back up into the woods. We were all very scared and ran into the house. My friend's dad believed us as he said he had seen a Bigfoot when they lived on Moses Lake, Washington. I was so scared I called my parents next door and wanted them to come pick me up in their car. My family dismissed our claims, but I know there was no way it was anything else but a Bigfoot. The next day, we went out into the field. We could not find any footprints, but could see where something large had run through the tall grass. Looking under the tree where I originally saw the stump, I estimated it was seven feet tall, based on a tree limb it was just beneath. There was a deer path where we saw it enter the woods. When we approached the path, my friend's dog started growling, so we took off. The next school day, we were riding the bus home. I was excited to tell the other kids what we had witnessed. Of course, they all started to tease us, and the other kids which had witnessed the encounter quickly backed off our story and would never speak of it again. I am 100% positive we saw a Bigfoot that day. No other animal could run on two legs with arms swinging the way this did. Its face was flat, so in no way could it have been a bear. It was too big and moved differently than a human. Based on the way it watched us and waited until it thought we were not looking at it, I believe it's an intelligent creature. I think we have them around us a lot more than we will ever know. I have had other experiences where I've heard vocalization, wood knocking, and possibly have smelled it too, but do not know for sure. I also know there are a lot more people who have witnessed similar events but never report it. I laugh at people that do not believe as I know the truth. Lee's Creek ran between us and the figure. I know of other Bigfoot sightings not on Mount Pleasant Road but others. 
on the Olympic Peninsula. I once knew a lady who had seen a white Bigfoot in Discovery Bay in Jefferson County while checking on a foaling mare one night. My husband and I heard tree knocking while cutting firewood up the Twin River area. In August, we were camping up at Soldu and smelled a terrible smell one night like rotting fish. I had our boys move into our tent with us, and in the middle of the night, our puppy woke me up terrified, but would not make a sound. His whole body was shaking, and he moved to the very back of the tent and kept his attention fixed forward. The smell was gone the next day. There was also stone stacked up down by the river which resembled the campground. I cannot be sure a person did not stack the stones, though. I am sure I have heard them before, but I did not know what it was. My brother knew a girl who found a footprint. On to the next one. Near Chinook Pass Highway 410, near Yakima, in Kittitas County in Washington. I haven't been there in years, but an area map would have Milk Lake on it, and the pond is on the way up to it. They clear-cut the area about the time we stopped going there, and it wasn't as pretty anymore. We had driven into Milk Pond up Chinook Pass about 30 miles from Yakima, Washington. We were headed to Milk Lake. That's up about five to seven miles above the pond. We got into the spot late, so we just drove past the pond and found a small area we could park our truck and cab over camper. We ate a quick dinner and went to bed. We never walked around or made any noise, so I don't think they ever knew we were there. You couldn't see our truck from the pond. In the middle of the night, the frogs from the pond stopped croaking, and this loud whistling and clicking noise started. I asked my husband what it was, and he said he thought it was a Bigfoot. It went on for about 15 minutes, then stopped. The next morning, I walked all around the pond, hoping to see a footprint, but didn't. We then went up the hill to the lake. No other people were around, and while we were fishing, we heard the strangest thing. It sounded like someone picked up a 55-gallon metal drum and threw it on the ground. I went in the direction of the noise, but couldn't see or hear anything. But we had the feeling of being watched. It was very creepy, so we left. We thought it was weird. The frogs stopped. Usually, if it was deer or elk, they would just keep croaking, but they stopped. My husband, Glenn, was also a witness. It was in Pine Forest. You have to drive up to get to the lake. Not many people know about it. And the last mile, you have to hike in. So... A lot of people don't hike. I know about it because I used to be in search and rescue, and we had a little boy drown in the lake, and we had to go up and find him. It's murky water. That's why it's called Milk Lake. So he was hard to find. That took a dark turn. On to the next one. in Lacey in Thurston County in Washington. It is now developed into what is called Lake Point by Patterson Lake, where I was fishing before the encounter. The dirt road is still there because of power lines that run over it. The woods are mostly gone because of development, and the two tree farms are non-existent. The nearest intersecting streets at the time were Ruddle Road and Yelm Highway. I was just talking to a friend, and he told me of the sight. I was 15 and coming back from fishing. The sun was up, but was on its way down. Fishing season had opened about a month before, and my Rottweiler and I were walking back from the lake. We were walking on a dirt road through some deep woods that turned into two Christmas tree farms. The road went through some Christmas trees that were old, maybe 15 plus years and a younger batch, two to three years old. We were walking just out of the woods into the two tree farms, maybe a couple of hundred yards away, when I looked off to the right and saw a big brown object moving swiftly through the small two to three old Christmas trees. It was far away, maybe 400 yards, and the Christmas trees were five to seven feet high. 
and at first I thought it was an elk moving at that distance. I slowed down to watch, partly to see what it was, and partly because we were going to run into each other. There was maybe 15 to 20 yards between the new trees and the old when the animal was a hundred or so yards off. My dog kind of whined, which I thought was odd because she was not afraid of anything. And looking down, her hair was up and she was right up against me. When out of the small trees, it came and in maybe four strides had made it across the 15 to 20 yards and across the dirt road into the bigger trees. It looked to be about five to six feet tall and was upright on two legs with hair the color of a grizzly's and of the same kind as an ape, but in longer strands. I only got a glimpse, maybe five seconds, but it was only 20 feet away at the last part and didn't seem to have even seen me as it went into the larger trees. I was scared and did not follow the road by where it went into the trees, but turned and crossed the small tree farm that ran at a run with my dog right beside me. Now the questions I have are why only five to six feet tall? I've heard they are seven to nine feet tall. Could it have been a young one or a female? I also did not notice any strong smell, which I'm sure I would have remembered. And why would my dog be afraid? Well, there is my experience, and to tell you the truth, I would not want to repeat it. What I found to be surprising was how quiet it was around the time it happened and how quiet the creature moved. It did not seem to be running or walking, but somewhere in between, but it sure covered a lot of distance in a hurry. When hearing elk running or deer, there always seems to be crashing, but with the creature, it was so quiet. I do not remember any noise. I live in the Northwest, where sightings are more common. I do not know anyone that says they have seen one, and this is the first time I've written it down. Most people don't even believe it. But at 20 feet away, it's not hard to miss. On to the next one. I have been back east for most of my adult life and have been out of regular contact with my Dene Navajo people. I had married young to a man from our tribe and when the relationship ended, I took the opportunity to move to New York State for a very rewarding career in fashion design. I will be a bit vague here, as I was recently summoned home, confidentially by my sister, whom I had not seen for 15 years. When I got her call out of the blue, I took a leave of absence and flew back to the place of my birth. I'm intentionally not identifying where this is due to fear of retaliation. My sister picked me up at the airport and we spent the next three days catching up on 15 years of lost time. I had no idea that my leaving had such a terrible burden on my dear sister as after my disastrous marriage, I had thought only of myself. Knowing my sister would be there for our mother, I eased my conscience for abandoning any further family contact while I salved my wounds and turned my life around. When my sister Annie brought me up to date, I was astounded that such evil goings-on could occur on a reservation. I'll explain. My sister had moved home to be with mother after our father died of alcohol poisoning. Annie told me that her mom started spending time with an evil man who held some sort of religious position with some members of our tribe. But since our father was of the Apache tribe, our customs being different, our mother had never pursued her Navajo culture until after father died. Annie said that mother began drinking heavily and hanging out with a strange group of friends. Annie introduced a new word into our vocabulary, a word that I had heard before from conversations as I eavesdropped as a child, but never understood. And that word was skinwalker. Then Annie proceeded to tell me a story that left me speechless for almost an hour as she recounted the last several years of agony and led to what must have been sheer terror for my poor dear sister. The skinwalkers, or Yi Naldolshi, in Navajo language, are purely evil witches that live anonymously among the Dene people, 
the mysterious man that Mother had been spending so much time with was evidently one of these witches. Annie said she would, on many occasions, follow Mother and this man as they walked into the dry wash behind her house and followed it for what she said was about a mile. But with the bright moonlit sky and the flashlights they carried, she could easily follow unseen. Once there, they always met with what Annie said were a bunch of scroungy, slimy people. Observing these goings-on, Annie said there was a lot of chanting by this evil man, and he danced and beat on a small drum, while wearing what she said appeared to be coyote or wolfskins tied loosely together. This went on for the better part of four months until Annie finally stopped following as often because these sessions also started involving heavy drinking of alcohol and, she said, Mother was thickeningly drunk most of the time. Well, I will now reveal what our mother told Annie as she was near death lying on her bed with Annie feeding her by hand. My sister said it took our mother over three hours to tell her the story that she insisted must be told so she could get it off her conscience and could die peacefully. Mother then confessed that her male friends in her new group were skinwalkers and she revealed what these evil witches were all about. Mother told Annie that the skinwalker can affect a curse on a person, so that the skinwalker, or another person in this case, our mother, can cause a person's death and then own their possessions. It seems that Mother's next-door neighbor had come into some money from an inheritance and remodeled her home, bought new furniture, and all sorts of extravagant items like jewelry, designer clothing, and a brand new luxury car. Annie said the skinwalker of our mother's acquaintance conjured up an evil curse that caused this woman to become very ill, and our mother ended up taking care of her until her neighbor died. The woman had written out a will and left everything to our mother, as was the intent of the skinwalker curse. The vile man expected our mother to share her newfound wealth with him, Annie dropped the phrase corpse powder, and she explained things Mother said best as she could recall, but I don't know what it meant, and Annie didn't know either. I have since learned that it is a powder made from the ashes of the dead as part of the witch's ceremony. It was hard to find any Navajo who would reveal this, not even another full-blooded Navajo, but thanks to several hours of furnishing whiskey to an old acquaintance from my past, I learned a lot. This horrible plot to turn this witchcraft into financial gain almost worked. Annie told me our mother was making arrangements to head to the country courthouse to have the deed to her deceased neighbor's home transferred into her name, and she was already driving the new car when there suddenly appeared a next of kin that nobody knew anything about. The neighbor lady had an estranged daughter who somehow heard about her mother's death and now she was here. In all the years Mother had been neighbors with this lady, and with raising my sister and me, it was a complete surprise to everyone. Annie said that Mother and her witch doctor friend had an immediate falling out. They had a big argument, and as Annie listened from the outside, she heard them yelling and cursing each other. She said they argued for over an hour. Then the witch man jumped in his pickup and tore down the road, sending up, a choking cloud of dust. Annie went back into the house where she found Mom slumped and collapsed on the floor, and she never recovered beyond telling Annie her appalling secret. Mom passed away shortly after. Annie said everything was in such turmoil that she was falling apart, and that's when she reached out to me. Although I have been aware that our culture has an inner network of a sort of secret society that exists under the surface, it is not discussed openly, and if one should ask for information from tribal officials, a person is met with denial and, more often than not, a stern warning to not pursue such foolish talk. My own inquiries in the process of settling Mother's affair were met with blank stares and dismissal, as if I were not of the same blood as they. This seems just fine with me, as until now I had a normal life. After everything was back to some semblance of normal, 
I left my sister with full ownership of mom's house and property, and I know the local residents were relieved to see me go. I was very happy to be far away from the evil of these skinwalker witches. For those who may make fun of Native American beliefs and fears, my advice is to leave well enough alone and never, ever get mixed up in trying to prove or disprove these wicked beings, because you will be entering a strange and frightening world that exists in a parallel plane to our own. That world is cruel and terrifying, and I'm convinced that it really does exist in its purely evil form. On to the next one. In retirement, my Uncle Jack moved to Rutland County in Vermont, having been employed as a graphic artist for most of his life. He also dabbled in watercolor painting as a hobby for an equally long period of time. Being a city boy for most of his life, he would head to the country whenever possible in search of some interesting subject matter to paint, with his favorite themes being fly fishermen, covered bridges, old farmhouses, and boats. He not only painted fly fishermen, but was totally taken to the hobby himself. I would go visit him periodically in order to fly fish with him, and within the immediate surroundings of his area alone, there were many great places to fish for brook trout. It was a veritable potpourri of fly fishing pleasure. On this day, we headed to a place where we had fished several times in the past, it being my uncle's favorite spot to fish, and with good reason. Not only was the fishing superb, but this location was some of the most beautiful Vermont property that you will ever set eyes on. While I fished on the rocky banks of this creek several years before, he had been on the other side of the creek with an easel, using me as a model for a painting. And I have this painting in my home to this very day. We were near a town called Wallingford, and were fishing a body of water known as Otter Creek. He knew a gentleman who owned an old farmstead that this creek passed through, and it was the combination of the man's property and outbuildings in conjunction with the shape and natural design of the creek in this area which made it such an outstanding location. I will do my best to bring you into this picture. The original owners of the farm had been cheesemakers and created what we now know as Vermont Cheddar. I would say the acreage was about 40, give or take a few, and there was a large farmhouse that sat in the middle of the land, as well as two very large, unpainted, and well-weathered barns. When you looked out over the farm from the elevation of the house, it was mostly cleared, rolling terrace land, aside from a few trees that had been left for shade and aesthetic. It was comprised of a number of large sections which were separated from each other with split rail fences and gates. This allowed the cows to graze in certain areas while allowing the rest to grow back. This terraced land rolled down to the edge of the creek where we were standing, with the creek itself being maybe 40 feet wide at this point, including its rock-strewn banks. Now, if you were to stand on the western side of the creek, your back would be to the farm, and if you crossed over to the eastern side, your back was now against a steep embankment that had trees of many shapes and sizes growing on it. The creek had grayish-colored, sharply angled stones on both of its banks as well as within it. Some weighed hundreds of pounds, and most of the larger stones within the river had fish hiding behind them. For the most part, the creek was about a foot deep, but there were also some smaller, deeper pools. The day was very overcast and gray, which I prefer over bright sunlight for fishing. So for me, it was perfect. 
there was not another soul in sight, as we had permission to be here by the owner, and he was away on a Christian missionary mission in South America. Since he was a doctor by trade, he and a medical team occasionally donated their skills and time to help others who are less fortunate than the rest of us. And so we were alone and tucked down into this creek. For those of you who don't fish, there are times when fishermen laugh and joke around, but most of the time is spent in silence and solitude. We had been quietly working the creek for two to three hours when we heard a large splash on the water that came from somewhere around the bend. I saw my uncle look in the direction of the splash, but we kept on fishing. Moments later, we heard a couple more splashes in quick succession. As we quietly began to move together toward the sounds, exchanging a couple of quiet words and wondering what must have made that noise, a splash always gets the utmost attention from a fisherman. It doesn't matter if you're in the bay, ocean, lake, river, or creek. A fisherman always wants to know what's splashing and why. So the two of us began to stealthily creep along the bank. We both were hunched over, trying to catch a first glimpse under some tree branches. All of a sudden, I saw a long, dark arm reach down and hit the water with a splash, and my uncle reeled backward and almost fell. He turned and mouthed to me, It's a darn Bigfoot, and waved for me to move back. We must have retreated about 100 yards away, moving to a point far beyond where we had begun, and for additional protection, we crossed to the other side of the creek and climbed up the farmer's first grassy berm to a point where we were about 15 feet or so above the creek. Slowly, we started to make our way to a place where we could see the creature, doing our utmost to use some bushes, and small trees of cover. Finally, we reached a favorable position and hunkered down to observe its movement. We were further away, but we could see even more now than we had seen from the creek. This Bigfoot must have been so preoccupied with trying to grab a trout that it didn't stand a chance of noticing us. We watched him try to grab a trout at least 20 times without success, but he just kept trying. This thing was determined. Now, just in case you don't know, trout are extremely slimy, and this slime acts as a protective coating. It's generally only after a good fight that you are able to cradle them very gently in your hand and take the hook out of their mouth. No matter who or what you are, the act of grabbing one while it was swimming is nearly impossible, hence the creature's obvious frustration. We must have watched for 45 minutes, and it still hadn't had any success in catching a trout. Finally, it looked up, surveyed the area briefly, and turned, climbing up the steep bank in three steps. And, having reached the top, it walked away out of our sight. The bank that it had climbed must have been about 15 feet tall and was on a very steep angle. When the monster had been standing next to this embankment, it had been well over half the height of the slope, and it took three strides up the steep embankment without using any hand grabs. Before it was gone over the top and out of our sight, it was absolutely out of this world. It was only once the thing was out of our sight that we began to talk quietly. When I had initially seen the arm come into view, I thought that it had to be five feet long. It turns out that my uncle had seen the head and upper body at the same time that I had seen the extended arm, so he knew what the thing was way before I did. Its hair had some rusty colored undertones to it, and I think that if the sun was shining, we would have been able to see more reddish hues. The hair was actually very long, 
and on some areas of its body, in particular the head, I would say that it was ten inches or so in length. It hung off the back of its arms as well. The head was somewhat conical, but not pointy, and the upper part of the skull stood out much prouder than ours. Its face was much flattened, and the jaw protruded well beyond its nose. Its facial skin was also very dark and deeply furrowed. In fact, the wrinkles were so deep that they appeared as painted black lines on the face and brow of the creature. I would estimate its weight at about 1,500 pounds. This beast's back was five times as thick as those of the most massive weightlifters that you have ever seen in your life. I would venture to say that it could probably snap a baseball bat in half with just its fingers. When we had briefly caught a back view of the creature, it appeared to me that its triceps were maybe 12 inches wide and perhaps even more than that. Now, try standing in front of a mirror while holding a ruler next to your arm and visualize what I am saying. When we saw it take the three steps up the embankment, its legs were obviously flexed to the maximum, with the thigh muscles having bulged to the point where they looked to be two feet thick. The body strength that would be needed to make this motion so quickly and without grabbing so much as a branch would be off the charts in the human realm. But this thing is in no way a human, nor is it our mutated offspring. This is some kind of animal. I remember seeing a film clip of a grizzly bear running down a deer on a mountain slope. This grizzly was booking it, and its musculature was all business. When I watch a deer get spooked and run away on my own property, it is incomprehensible that anything else could catch it. And yet, this 1,500-pound grizzly had the wherewithal to do so. It was all so real, and yet so unreal at the same time. I know you get it, but when you are there, seeing it with your own two eyes, it's only then that the legend can ring true and become part of your reality. On to the next one. It is one of the most fundamental questions of our species. The question of whether we are alone in the cosmos. The smart money says no, given the astronomical numbers of planetary systems in our own galaxy, let alone in the observable universe. It seems unlikely that biological beings would spring up here on Earth and nowhere else. Surely, there must be other worlds conductive to life, perhaps complex life, perhaps even intelligent life. But if that is the case, then where are all the aliens? This was the question famously posited by Enrico Fermi back in 1950, and to some, the answer is obvious. They are here, among us, invading our airspace, and sometimes even beaming us up to their ships. If that sounds flippant, it's not meant to be. There are people who fervently believe this, who claim even to have encountered these aliens, and some of their stories are difficult to debunk. Berkshire County, Massachusetts, is a great place to live. Nestled into the far west corner of the state, it is typically New England, all rolling hills and emerald forests that turn into riots of red and gold in the fall. Picture book pretty towns dot this landscape, places like Lenox, and Great Barrington straight out of a Norman Rockwell painting. Indeed, Rockwell spent the latter years of his life here, living in Stockbridge. It was an ideal place to raise a family back then. It is now, and it was in 1969 when our story takes place. It was just after dusk on the scorching hot Labor Day of September 1st, 1969. Jane Green and her friend Mary were driving along U.S. Route 7, heading from Stockbridge to their home in Great Barrington. 
Jane was at the wheel when she spotted a bright light in the distance. At first, she thought there must be an accident up ahead, but as she got closer, the light became so blinding that she had to pull to the side of the highway. As she did so, she noticed that several of the vehicles ahead of her had done the same thing. A number of the drivers had gotten out and were standing on the black top. Jane did likewise. She had a better view of the light now. It appeared cylindrical, about two stories high, wide enough to span well beyond both sides of the road. Incredibly, this massive disc seemed to be hovering in the air. Then it rose silently into the night sky and made a shift to the far right and flew away at an incredible speed, disappearing over the hill. At the same time that Jane Green was having this odd encounter, 10-year-old Tom Warner was visiting his neighbor, Jane Shaw, in the town of Great Barrington, a kid with an artistic side. Tom liked to drop by the Shaws where Jane's older sister, Debbie, would give him instructions on his Crayola masterpieces. On this night, he just finished a picture when he felt himself drawn to the window. He then heard what he'd later describe as a voice in his head, telling him to go home. So commanding was this instruction, the boy felt powerless to ignore it. He dashed from the house, not even saying goodnight to his host. Alarmed, Jane ran after him, but was brought to his shuddering halt by what she saw. Tom was out on the lawn, bathed in a beam of light from above. He was running at full tilt, except Tom wasn't going anywhere. He was running in place. As Jane watched, the boy's arms were thrown back, almost as if he'd suddenly encountered a fierce headwind. Then, right in front of Jane's disbelieving eyes, Tom Warner disappeared. Thomas Reed was the same age as Tom Warner on that September 9th in 1969. Unlike his namesake, whose family had six generations of history in Berkshire County, Tom was an outsider. His family was from New York. His mom, Nancy, had relocated them there so Tom and his brother could grow up away from the crime and grime of the big city. Nancy owned and operated the popular Village Green Restaurant in Sheffield. The family had enjoyed dinner there that night and were heading home at around 9 p.m. Tom and his brother were in the back seat. The boy's grandmother was sitting in front. Nancy was behind the wheel. It was just as they were crossing the covered Sheffield Bridge that they encountered a UFO. According to Tom's later account, the craft rose up from the trees, flanking the Housatonic River. Suddenly, the car was flooded with light, so bright that Tom could make out every detail inside the vehicle. He and his mom would later describe the UFO in words startlingly similar to those used by Jane Green. Cylindrical, at least a hundred yards wide, easily two stories tall. Despite its massive size, there was no sound. In fact, everything had become very calm, as though they were in the eyes of a tornado. Then, suddenly, there was a pressure drop, like being underwater, as Nancy described it, and an eruption of noise from the local wildlife. Frogs and crickets and other insects croaking and chirping in concert. The car's occupant could remember nothing after that. They woke up over two hours later in the parking lot of a drugstore in Sheffield. The car's ignition was off, and there was one more oddity. Nancy was in the passenger seat, her mother behind the wheel. The older woman had never driven a car in her life. On the night of September 1st, 1969, Melanie Kirchdorfer was 12 years old. The last thing she wanted to do on a gorgeous late summer eve was to go out for ice cream with her parents. Yet, Melanie had no say in the matter. She and her sister were ushered into the family's car and driven to Dairy Queen 
in Great Barrington. From there, their dad drove them to nearby Lake Mansfield, where they could enjoy their treat under the stars. He'd just backed into the parking lot when the car was suddenly lit up from above. Melanie would later recall being terrified. When her father decided to chase after the light, she and her sister begged him not to. The next thing that Melanie recalls was being inside a huge ship, along with hundreds of other children. She was splayed out on her back, apparently levitating. Then, suddenly, she was awake again, back in the parking lot, except that now she was alone. Her parents and sister and the car were nowhere to be seen. Melanie had to walk home that night. Neither her parents nor her sister had any recall of the incident other than the light they'd seen. Her mother was certain it was a shooting star. At around the same time that Melanie Kirchdorfer was waking up alone at Lake Mansfield, Tom Warner was reappearing before the startled eyes of his friend Jane Shaw. According to Jane's later account, he'd been gone for seven minutes. Like Melanie, Tom would later recall being aboard some kind of craft. Inside a huge hangar was how he described it. He would also recall seeing Melanie there. The pair had never met before. When they were first introduced years later, Melanie described feeling an instant connection with Tom. Tom and Melanie, Tom and Nancy, Jane Shaw and Jane Green had all experienced something extraordinary that night and they were not the only ones. From all of those towns straddling Route 7, from Pittsfield, Lenox, Stockbridge, Great Barrington, Egermont, Sheffield, from as far afield as North Cannon, Connecticut, reports of the UFO sightings were pouring in. Local radio station, WSBS, was inundated with them, with host Tom J. fielding calls late into the night. Unfortunately, the station did not consider the recordings of that show important enough to preserve. The tapes were dubbed over by the following night's broadcast, deleting dozens of first-hand accounts of a possible alien encounter. The local newspaper, the Berkshire Eagle, treated the sightings with similar disdain, devoting not a single column inch to a story with the editorial staff regarded as a hoax. As for police reports, there weren't any. In the midst of the most extraordinary event in the country's history, it seemed that no one had called the authorities. Great Barrington PD logs for that night show only a few minor complaints and not a single one to do with lights in the sky. Perhaps those who saw them were afraid to file a report, afraid of ridicule. And those are justified fears. The people who did speak out about their experiences on that September night were generally dismissed, disdained, even harassed. Jane Green kept her story mostly to herself, not even telling her children until years later when they were grown up. Melanie Kortscherfer at least had her sister and boyfriend who believed her, but she didn't discuss the incident with anyone else. Tom Warner did talk about it, even painting a picture of what he'd seen. He'd later relate how he could never get a date in high school because he was considered weird. The Reed family suffered perhaps the greatest persecution. Tom Reed was the most outspoken of those who had seen the UFO, and he was bullied at school as a result. His family was also targeted. Nancy would be tailgated on the road, and she was also harassed at her business. She eventually sold up and left Sheffield. The events of September 1st, 1969, remain one of the most perplexing in the UFO record. But what was it that the residents of Berkshire County saw that night? Was it really a craft from another world? Without evidence, for or against that question, is impossible to answer. All we know is that the usual explanations offered in these circumstances, that it was swamp gas or a weather balloon, or some experimental military aircraft 
seem inadequate. This was a phenomenon, remember, that was witnessed by hundreds of people along a geographical corridor 50 miles long, all of them telling essentially the same story. Can they all really be lying or confused or involved in some conspiracy? Surely not. In February of 2015, the Great Barrington Historical Society officially recognized the September 1969 sighting as genuine, calling it the first off-world UFO case in U.S. history. A monument was erected in Sheffield commemorating the event. It was defaced with graffiti within the first week. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!